As people come in, we'll see what happens. We have to do it a second time, we'll do it a second time, but uh, we're going to start with what we have and we see who shows up. I'm going to go Facebook Live, so again, if you, if you like what we say here, you can grab it on the Independent Black Voters Group or, or any of the things under Brian Harris and let your folks know what's going on. So, I thank the people who have, who have come out for the Black Business Expo. Uh, today, the Expo is really uh, telling people who we are and why we need the Black Business Council. So, I'm going to start off uh, telling us who we are first. Um, and I want to introduce one, one, of the, one of the founders of the Black Business Council who can tell you even a little bit more than I can. But uh, the Black Business Council was designed with the sole concept of supporting black-owned businesses. They don't focus on anything but supporting black-owned businesses. Now, everybody, the change we're making today, everybody, I don't care if you're black, brown, purple, green, if you can follow our mission of supporting black-owned businesses, then you are welcome in the Black Business Council. Why do I say that? We are in America. Everybody says they love America. If you love America and part of America is in trouble, then it is, behoves everybody to focus on helping them. We're happy about helping veterans. We're happy about seeing other groups go up, but they are making statements that are dire in the black community. And so if that's the case, everybody should be as concerned as us. America is only as strong as its weakest link. And if from an economical aspect, we have the weakest link, then everybody should be concerned in strengthening that, that link. So, again, it was established by actually Mr. Ernest Fountain. He was a person I have a lot of respect for. I met him years ago when I really didn't know what was going on. He was talking about access to capital. He was talking about the fact that black folks can do just what everybody else can do. It's that we have this thing called money that we don't have this thing called money that does that inhibits our ability to compete on even an unlevel playing field because the the playing field is not level even when we have money it is not level but uh, he created the black business council to raise awareness and to focus specifically on the black community we are fortunate to have mr dave washington in here i'm going to ask him to say hi and kind of just tell people a little bit more about the council because he's been one, he's been on the board, he's, he's been one of the people that has continued to push the need for the Black Business Council. So just say, just say a couple quick words for me, sir. Well, thank you, Brian, for the opportunity to say a couple of words. Yes, I'm a former board member, still an active member of the council, and I can tell you that it's incumbent upon us as black folks to look out for our own interests. And nobody has ever heard us get up in any of our expos and say, we don't like white folks. Never will happen, because we're all American citizens. However, if you look at all the economic indicators, blacks are last in every economic indicator that you can imagine. One thing that Brian and I have been harping on for the last few months, and a lot of people aren't getting it, apparently, because you know we somebody, remember a couple times, President Obama was called a monkey, and they had 10,000 people down in New York to, to go walking and demonstrate. We have been raising cane about this Raider Stadium. They have what they call the Benefits Committee. They won't tell us what the numbers are in terms of black folks working at that particular stadium. And it's, it's a shameful thing that they're doing, and I'm talking about the folks who are sitting on that board. And we've gone before the Stadium Authority, we've gone before the Benefits Committee, and they won't tell us because the numbers are bad. It's okay if they're bad, but let us know. And the reason why we're raising so much cane, there's $750 million that's coming from tax dollars. It's, it's room tax, but as far as I'm concerned, with our education system being as bad as, as it is, that money could have went to education. Forget that stadium. Let them millionaires take care of that. It's a shame, and nobody's raising cane, but the, the two that's down there most frequently is Brian and I. But there's nothing wrong with us caring for our own folks. And there's another thing that I just learned about the other day that's going on in our community that we should be raising cane about. Once it hits the fan, I hope that people will stand up. I am a veteran 
retired firefighter after 33 years with the City of Las Vegas Fire Department. They're getting ready to do some testing that's going to be very bad for our people. Because what I'm told is it's going to ask you as an entry level, entry level person to do some things that are required of firefighters. They're going to give you certain books that you got to study. You got to know what they call know what they call EMS protocols. If, to know EMS protocol, you better be working for an ambulance service. How many black folks have y'all seen working at a private ambulance service? Not very many. So my point is, it's another obstacle to keep us out of that business. And mm -hmm. our numbers are going down tremendously. In 1998, blacks made up 15% of all paid professional firefighting jobs in America, while we probably get at population-wise 11, 12%. 2010, they say we're at 8%. Well, here we are getting ready to go into 2020, and I bet you we're about 6 to 8%. Well, no, I, I don't think we're at 8. I, I'd say 4 to 6 percent. And people say, well, why do you care? Because those are public dollars, and we should get our fair share of that. That's something that we fought for in the 80s with, with the city of Las Vegas. And these kinds of things, we must keep our eyes on. And somehow, some way, people really, they learn who to pick to put on these various committees who ain't going to make no noise. They'll just take their few crumbs, and y'all should be happy. No, we shouldn't. Not if we're not getting our fair share. So. I'm going to be radical and militant to the day God takes me out of here because I believe that we, we must stand up and be mean. And like I say, we just want our share. And our share is not crumbs, which is what some do. And that's kind of off the beaten path, but... No, the, the, but our share should be at least upwards of about, uh, what's our people in this country? That's right. 39% now? No, blacks are not 39%. We're 13% roughly. 12, 12 to 14%. No, no, no. Wow, but, my but, bad. But the, but, <laughs> no, but, but the bottom line, brother, you're okay. still on point in terms of you look at those numbers, and from those numbers, we should get a fair, equitable amount of various jobs, particularly this is a job that's a, that stadium is public private partnership. Mm -hmm. And on the public side, that means they got some money from the public, and they got it from us. And Thank we just, you. yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And we just sitting around. Like, it's okay because we're Raider fans, like my wife. But she's hot, too. But she's a Raider. I'm not a Raider fan. But whether I was a Raider fan or not, the bottom line is we want to get some of the economics that's coming out of that particular project. That's a multi, that's a multi-billion dollar project, and we're getting crumbs. We want to know, and I'm glad you got this online, brother. We want to know how many blacks have concessions out there. We want to know how many black vendors. We want to know how many black employees working on that particular project. And anybody who is black but don't want to know, something's wrong with you. And I don't mind calling you out. But thank yep. you for the opportunity, Brian. And thank as you. As far as the Black Business Council, we need more people to join. And as he said, you don't have to be black to join this council. But you have to have our philosophy in mind. If you don't have our philosophy in mind, even if you're black, don't come. Because we're going to be in people's faces trying to get done what we need to be done as a people. And that's not being mean-spirited. It's just about... Hey, we want our share, period. Thank you. My pleasure. I was Dave Washington. I have a lot of respect for this man. He was one of the first fire chiefs, and he has been a fighter for this community forever. So let me tell you a little bit of what we're going to talk about. Um, we want to know, we want to let you know, whether you're here or not, who we are, why the BBC is important, what is our mission, issues. But they say that by 2053, black people will have no wealth in America. That, that does not mean we will have good paying jobs. That does not mean we'll have millionaires and a couple of billionaires. But as a group, they say we will have zero wealth. And that is a thing that scares me, and it should scare you. You're either going to be saying, well, I'm going to get mine and be one of the few that has crumbs, or you're going to say, we need to change the trajectory for the black people across the country so that we are not, not just second, but now third class citizens in the United States. We need to talk about what's the root cause. A lot of it is why we must rebuild the black economy. The barriers, access to capital, unlevel playing fields, and some other things we'll talk about. The solutions. How are we going to fix what we're doing today? So let me start off by first telling people the Black Business Council and what it's doing. Our mission, 
uh, vision and mission state. The vision of the Black Business Council is to attain a level playing field by which Black-owned businesses can compete on an equal footing with their business counterparts worldwide. The mission, the Black Business Council of Nevada's mission is to be an, affluent, an influential voice for the promotion and growth of black businesses and entrepreneurs, working together to educate, empower, and provide resources and capital acquisition for economic growth and sustainab sustainability. So what are we trying to do? Well, part of it is membership. We are not an organization that has that is financially backed by a lot of the MGMs, the Raiders, etc. As a matter of fact, we are self-funding with which little we have, but that's okay. Our objective is not to here to become a rich organization. Our objective is to be an organization that truly enacts change that is positive for our community. We cannot and will not be bought. We will ask the tough questions. Be you look like me or you don't, we will ask the tough questions because it is time that we challenge everybody and hold them accountable. If you're going to be a leader in the community, then you have to be willing to take the bullet. I say that everybody wants to be the leader, but nobody wants to take the bullet. Well, it's time for you to be a leader, to be a leader that is not just concerned about a few, but concerned about us as black people as well. So that is the mission statement. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit of why they say the issue is by 2053, black people will have no wealth in America. That's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? They say by 2053, black people will have no wealth in America. Well, if you look at the issues of mass incarceration, we have a generation of people that are now being let out of prison. They will have not even have the amount of, of, of months, years required for Social Security because they've lost their working time frames. So you look at what's going to happen is they're out of jail, but they'll never retire. They're older. They can't do certain work. And they're going to end up either back in jail or worse on the street. That's why you're seeing a a booming homeless issue in America, and you're gonna find as things go forward more and more, you're gonna see more and more African Americans who are gonna be homeless. Because by 2053, guess what? Our parents who used to be in government jobs will have passed. Their job, their businesses, or their homes will have been lost. And we as a group will be the lost folks that don't have a safety net to survive. So guess what, folks? We either change the trajectory or we don't. You look at the growth of the fact that our business growth is declining. The amount of black-owned businesses is declining significantly. Home ownership is declining significantly in America. We're in a situation where all the positive indicators are negative in the black community. And folks, I'm going to say this. We need to have political people who will be willing to talk about our agenda. And here we have some of the political people here to listen to what we have to say. And then our goal is for them to listen to what we have to say, to talk to us a little bit about our issues, and to go back to their candidates and maybe say, this is what black people really want. We don't want to be told what we want. We want to tell you what we need. And if you do that, there's a chance you can earn our vote because our vote is not free. So, the root cause, they say by 2053 that we will have no wealth. Unfortunately, and I call it the miseducation of black America, and it goes back to the civil rights movement. Many of us have heard Martin Luther King say, his speech of I have a dream. Everybody thinks, oh, I have a dream is such a great speech. How many people know that at the end, he said, I fear I may have led my people into a burning house. He said that because there was a realization as time went by that maybe we gave up 
the black economy to sit at somebody's, at somebody's uh, food counter and give them our economics. He realized that maybe we gave up too much for what we got. He started to realize that his dream was not really happening. And I say it to start from there to say we have to understand that the miseducation of black America is one of the major problems. I'm an independent. I'm a lean Democrat, but I lean to those who talk to me, be they libertarians, be they Republicans, because we have to understand that every vote should be earned and it should be about us and not about diversity, not about minority, not about somebody else. It should be about the issues in the black community. And I state that we have to be re-educated because it is a lot harder to teach a person who is uneducated than it is to reteach a person who is miseducated. And I say that because we have been miseducated. Many times we have political people who say, well, we're gonna bring you jobs, 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 jobs. And I tell people, we had full-time un unemployment. It was called slavery. We need business opportunities. We need ownership. We need to have laws that level the playing field. We need to address these false barriers that are put up so that we do not have the opportunity to compete. Most people would say, I don't want everything free. I don't really want free, free, free. I don't want for all, I just want the opportunity to go out and get it. I want an equal level playing field. I want access to capital. I just want a playing field that allows me to win when I put my efforts in. Because when free and everything is given to us, we tend to not get much of that free. And we get blamed as being the reason. So I want people to think about that. We have to deal with the miseducation of us so that we understand how to rebuild the black economy. Many of us don't understand how important it is to support black owned businesses. Many of us are afraid. We've been doped into think you're prejudiced. Oh, I don't want to be a racist. I don't want to be prejudiced. I don't see color. But everybody else does. Everybody else does. The Asian community thrives on supporting each other. They have Chinatowns all over the world, and especially here in the United States. The Jewish community supports each other. I love everybody. I spend my money with everybody else but I go out of my way to purposely say that I'm gonna spend some of my money with black owned businesses because they are the ones who will hire you. They are the ones who will hire your sons. They are the ones that will hire your family. They are the ones that will stop the 2053 direction of black America. We must rebuild the black economy. Why and what is keeping us from building the, the, the black economy? Access to capital, unlevel playing field. And I'm looking for you all to give me ideas because once we go by here, I want your opinion. This isn't just about me lecturing, but I gotta set the table so we can all eat, okay? And those out there here on Facebook, if you got some opinions, let me know. But the barriers that are designed are big barriers. Access to capital. Let me tell you something. Black folks have always competed with one hand tied behind their back. And we've been very successful. But in business, if you do not have access to capital, you cannot grow your business. We're competing against businesses that are highly capitalized and we're trying to figure out how we can compete with them. And it's almost impossible. While we're dealing about everything, I'm gonna give you a great example. The construction industry. And this is gonna tie into what 
Mr. Washington talked about earlier. There have been big strides in the construction industry that was at least 98, 99% white male. You've seen a major increase, increase of veterans, women, disabled, others, while you've seen a major decrease in black participation. Why is that? A lot can be said about the tags. Right now, people love to talk about diversity. They love to talk about minority. They like, love to talk about things that are acceptable diversity. Let me tell you the trick that goes on in the construction industry if you don't know it. If I'm a white con contractor, I can take my mother, I can take my daughter, I can take my girlfriend, I can give them $10 million. They're still a small business, but now they're a woman-owned business. One hand washes the other hand and it stays all in the family. And they tell us, hey, let's cheer. Look at all the diversity that's going on now. Look at all the inclusion that's going on now. But for black people, it's a lie. We're asked to accept these lies and to cheer on our demise. And folks, if we don't start standing up for ourselves, nobody else will. If we don't start re-educating ourselves on what's going on here, then we're doomed. Part of what the Black Business Council is trying to do is address these barriers. Unlevel playing field. What is one of the biggest things that African Americans went to jail for? The war on drugs, marijuana. But guess what? When folks like us realized how much illegal money was going in the black community, they made it legal and took it. And they put up barriers to keep us out. And they tell us, hey, we're going to let y'all out of jail after, you had so, after you're so old, you can't get Social Security, and you can't take care of yourself. So we're all applauding this whole thing about marijuana and legalization and letting people out of jail while we're missing the boat. It's one of the largest growth industries in America that they have put in barriers of entry so that we can't make any money. They put us in jail. We created the industry, and now they locked us out. And now they locked us out. We must understand what's going on. Give me a second. I, I don't want this to happen again. <laughs> we must understand what's going on, and we must voice the people what's going on. Because if we sit here and let people clap, be it politicians who want to tell us about how many people they are letting out of jail, but don't want to discuss about the fact that we don't have the opportunity economically, then we're celebrating our demise. And we need to have groups like the Black Business Council who says, let's talk about black. Let's tell us we know what game you're playing economically, and we're not going to continue to vote for you no matter what party you are unless you're willing to address the issues that are in our community. So that's why you're here. And I thank everybody who took the time to come out here. And I take everybody who's watching now. We must make a change. We must change the unlevel playing field. We cannot continue to celebrate our demise. But we must be together. If we are like this, five fingers out, then we don't have a fist. Just because an organization has been here, legacy or whatever, if they're not addressing economic issues, then you should have a problem with them. Because folks, we are in a capitalist society, no matter what we say. Those who own the cheese, own the trap. 
And if we don't decide that we need to own the cheese too, not, not rent it, not eat it, but own it, if we don't start telling them, I know your game, don't just talk to me about the stuff that is non-economics, rah, rah, rah. Talk to me about the economic parts. And matter of fact, not just talk about it, fix it. Then you ain't going to get my vote. Then I might shut you down. I might shut the strip down. If that's what it takes. Because as a young man over here said, a young man called Dave Washington, he said, radical, we not radical, we're realist. We're going to speak the truth whether you like me or not. I had a person say to me just recently, people don't like you. They don't like you because, man, you don't play good in the sandbox. <laughs> I don't care. We're not here to play in the sandbox that we don't own. We're here to create sandboxes that we own. And unless people understand that we're willing to do it, we're willing to make them uncomfortable. We're going to join hand as black brothers and sisters and my white brothers and sisters and my Hispanic brothers and sisters who are going to support our agenda, not turn it to their agenda, our agenda, and then we'll support your agenda. So the unlevel playing field, we've got to fix it. You don't fix it till you tell people that it's un. It's unlevel and we need to fix it. So what are the solutions? I'm going to put this down with you real quick. First thing, we need to be me. The biggest problem we made was we want to hide behind being a minority. We want to hide behind and celebrate the diversity tags. When people say, I'm not into that tag, oh, they look at me like, what's wrong? because it's time that I talk about the black man and the black woman and the opportunities they need. Y'all doing pretty good in the Asian community. Y'all doing pretty good in the Hispanic community. Y'all doing pretty good in the Jewish community. So I want to talk about not y'all, I want to talk about me and my own and how we are going to do good like you all. So we got to stop hiding behind it and letting people say, oh, diversity, minority, those are definitions that they can use and exclude us more than they use as a place to include us. So, the Black Business Council, we need you. Right now, there are two paid members in the Black Business Council. That's myself and Mr. Harvey who came over. But people have to say, where am I going to put my time and why would I put my time with this little group called the Black Business Council? They ain't nothing. Nobody knows them. They, they're not this chamber. They're not this group. They're not that group. Why do I want to go with them? They're not a big name. We're not. But we're carving a big bat. We're going to walk tall. We're going to talk about our issues. So. To let you know a little bit of where we're headed. And folks, we need you all. We need 100 members that are saying, I'm part of the Black Business Council, because we need you all. There is strength in numbers. There is strength in numbers. Mr. Washington talked about the Raider Stadium. Stadium. About a year and a half ago, Mr. Washington will tell you, I saw a certain young man that, was, that looked like me in the news talking about how great the stadium was going and how they are exceeding their small business expectations and their women-owned expectations. So I sent an email to that person that said, that's great, but tell me how many black people are working and how many black businesses are working. And he will attest. I sent it to him, I sent it to some of our elected officials, and I heard crickets. They said, we're not going to tell you that. You want to know why? What would be your definition of a small business? How, many rev how much revenue do you think a small business would bring, maximum? Well, because of my industry, 250 million. 
small business. It's considered, okay, great. She says 250. How much do you think a small black business uh, small, would be? A lot less than 250 million. Hello, young, young ladies, how are you? Well, let me tell you, the definition for the stadium was $18 million, was considered to be a small business. There may be two or three businesses that ha that are black owned that generate over 18 that, uh, that generate anywhere near 18 million dollars and when you look at the union part there may be one or two that have the capacity so we were effectively written out of opportunity that they ask us to celebrate and i'm going to tell you like this i love black people i love everybody i love everybody back here no matter what your color is, but I love black people. And I can't stand there and watch us be bamboozled or miseducated or miscommunicated while we sit there and watch our demise. We wrote this letter, it was a four page letter that we put in to the community benefits program to say, look, we wanna know the numbers so if, if we know them, we can fix the problem. We already know the numbers are bad. They don't want to say it because they know they're bad. And once they say it, they have to address the problem. That's why they said, well, you know them, you can go get them. No, I don't want to go get them. I want you to tell me the numbers. So now you have responsibility for those numbers. Does that make sense? So now we can figure out how to fix it. I don't want excuses. Oh, they're not ready. Oh, they're not putting in the right paperwork. Oh, they're not doing this. You promised the community benefits program for all communities to rise with the tide. And we hold you to the spirit of their document, not the minimum required to meet SP1. But guess what? If Dave and I are the only ones in there crying, they just ignore us. If 100 black people are showing up there saying this ain't right, and then 1,000 show up, guess what? You'll see black businesses, not even at the start, but through the management, uh, when they look at who gets the uh, opportunities to sell in there, who gets to do everything else, they say something, a closed mouth don't get fed. And if we as a group want to be a closed mouth, and those who have the opportunities choose to be silent because they want the crumbs, then we are the people who are at fault. I tell you about the stadium because right now, our issue is to drive them to have a dialogue with the Black Business Council, not the Urban Chamber, not another group, but with us for solutions, for ideas on how we can do training, for setting up ways that we can get expedite black people in the union, finding good black people who want to go to the union. And I'm going to tell you why. I happened to run into this Hispanic guy who said in 11 months, he made $198,000 on the stadium. $198,000 in 11 months. That's why I wanna know how many black people are working. That's why I wanna know how many black businesses are working. Because when that happens, the cost of living goes up in this area. So even if you, not only do you not make the money, the cost of housing is going up, the cost of food is going up, the cost of breathing is going up, and we're being left at the shores. And we're being silent. We're not saying, hey, 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 you forgot me, I want to get on the boat. And if legacies won't talk about it, the Black Business Council will. If they don't like me, I don't care. But I'm telling you where we're going. Public works. Many of you don't know, there is a, it's called AB 281. It was put in by the Black Caucus push to know and count the number of people by race and gender that do any work on public works. Now, the Raiders want to say, well, we're under SB1, and so that doesn't count for us. We don't have to give you the numbers. 
Well, the truth of the matter is you do. You took government money. And you may not consider it to be public works, but I do. So sometimes you say, well, let's go to court and find out. Because sometimes you got to make them uncomfortable to get that information to get what you want. And I'm telling you, we're willing to do what it takes to shake the tree. When I shake the tree, apple's not going to fall on me because the one who shakes the tree don't get the apples. But if some of us get the apples, then it was well worth shaking the tree. But we got to understand why. Because though there are some of us who are going to be afraid. They're going to say, why would you want to go over to the Black Business Council? They ain't nothing. Why you want to dis listen with him? He's a troublemaker. Oh, man, you need to do A, B, and C. How's it working for us now? How's it working for us now? So we're going to go after public works because right now they can, I can tell you that right now they are not meeting their requirements and we stay silent as everybody else makes a lot of money in every other group but us. Hey man, how you doing? The strip. Man, the strip. This is an interesting one. And again, we have to have power. We can't, we can't do this alone. See a lot of black folks working in the strip? Hmm? I see some on Fremont Street, but I definitely don't see them like, I, like that on, on the strip. Do you see them through all levels of organization? How many of you all ever heard of the, um, what is it, in 71? It was the, uh, what was the agreement? It was the uh, consent decree, decree of, of 1971. Anybody heard of that? Huh? Let me tell you a little bit of it. In 1971, they were not allowing black folks to work on the strip. And the NAACP put in a suit and they threatened to shut down the strip. Of course, they didn't want that to happen because it would get worldwide news and it would affect their bottom line. So they turned around and said, guess what? Black folks, we don't get what you want. We're going to hire more black people at all levels at all levels of our organization. And we saw that bump for a short period of time. Then we took our eye off the ball. They changed it to diversity and inclusion. They changed it to minority. How you like us now? We're probably less than we were with the beginning of the consent degree, decree. Because we dropped the ball. Because we want to play well in the sandbox and say, what about us? And if we don't start realizing the importance of little groups like the Black Business Council, we're going to bring these back up. This is stuff they don't want to talk about. Me and Dave together and Richard, they'll ignore us. We get 500 people talking about it, they'll talk to us. And you may not get employed, but your brother might. Or your son or your daughter might. Or a friend of theirs might. Because we need to own operate, but we also need to be in those so that we learn how to compete. If we're not in there learning how to compete, then we're also at a disadvantage. So, <sighs> training and outreach. A lot of people get paid a lot of money to do outreach in our community. A lot of people get paid to do training for minorities. But for some reason, we're getting left on the sands again. People don't realize they did on Lake Me the big training center culinary when it was predominantly African American and the wages were low. Now it is predominantly not African American as the wages get higher. People don't understand that they do training, but when it comes to union opportunities, it's done by people who really don't want us to be part of their unions. We need to take over the training and the outreach and give them solutions so they can't say, I can't find anybody good. 
I can't find anybody qualified. They don't just want to work. They're lazy. I don't believe that. That's what you call victim blaming. And we have to basically say, if you can't do it, we'll do it. Let us train. Let us outreach. Focusing on black people, not minorities. Not women, because guess what? Black women are part of the equation. So let us help you develop it. Let's put together some training programs for skilled trades. Let's put, put some things together that we can say, fund us so we can find you what you need. Don't fund somebody else who, who purposely doesn't find us. So we need to figure out as we become stronger, we have the ability to negotiate these things. But if it's just the three of us, we have no power to force change. We must become a united voice. We need every one of you all to consider being part of the Black Business Council. This is how we fund ourselves. Guess what? We have almost no money in the bank. But it ain't about having money in the bank. It's about having the people that want to drive change. I ask every one of you all to consider joining the Black Business Council. There's an annual fee of, of um, there's an annual fee of twenty-five dollars, or you can pay fifty and sponsor somebody else if you can afford to. But we need to become a united front. And we need to have a little bit in the bank so we can do a few things, like pay the, the, the money to go out and do litigations. Because guess what? We have two lawyers who said they're going to do pro bono for us to help us make some noise. But we still got to have something to do. So I'm, I'm going to ask you all to consider joining everybody in here the Black Business Council, and I'm going to ask you to consider to get five or six of your friends to join. Bring the noise, bring the people, and we'll bring the voice. Political voice. How many of you have joined? I have a Facebook called the Independent Black Voter. Our vote is not free. Any of y'all on that? See, look here. I encourage you all to get on that, but more importantly, learn what our issues are. It is not what the candidates' issues are. It is about our issues. And guess what? Social justice is very important, I think, to most black folks. Driving while black, living while black, doing a lot while black. Unfortunately, social justice is something that dis social injustice is something that disproportionately happens to black people. But let me give you a secret. Economics plays a key into it. If you have no economics, you are a third class citizen. If you are perceived as a group to be nothing more than consumers, and not very good consumers at that, even though we're one of the hard, highest consumers, we are disrespected. So understand, rebuilding the black economy comes down to increasing social justice. They go hand in hand. And we need to understand that when we demand to level the economic playing field, we are also creating more social justice. Does it make sense? So, political voice. We want to talk, and we have some candidates here who are listening first. And then I'm going to let them come up and talk about what they've heard and what they may want to go back and talk to their people about as it pertains to what black people want. And again, black, different people, black people eat different things. I'm just giving you an opinion, one man's opinion, that hopefully some of you all believe in some of these issues. And I want you to tell them some of the things, listen to them and tell them some of the things that you see that may be different from what I see. Because we need to have people come and listen to us and not preach to us about what we need. Guess what? I want affordable medical, med Medicaid. I don't necessarily need to have the government do that. I want affordable health care. But I want opportunity so that I can do A, B, and C if I so choose to. 
but maybe we're told, oh, this, that, and the other. So again, they're going to be here to listen and tell uh, to us and tell the things. So you can get to ask them some questions and talk to them in a minute. We're going to fight to get involved in the growth in industries around here. In the here, I used to start off the marijuana industry. There is one 100% owned black owned dispensary. Anybody know who that is? Don't say Richard. Don't say David. Anybody know who that is? Oh, that's, Frank. that's Frank. Nevada Wellness is the only 100% black owned dispensary. That's a phenomenal growth area. Marijuana, weed, is like printing dollars. It's gold. They're still putting us in jail for illegally selling weed. And they're locking us up for illegally, for, for legally, for, I mean, they put the barriers so we cannot legally sell weed because they made the high cost barriers to happen. And we sat there quietly because they told us, hey, y'all gonna get smoking, not go to jail. Y'all gonna get smoking, not go. We said, oh, okay, we should have been saying no. Let's talk economics. I'm gonna tell you something. Mr. Sisolak, when he was running, he had a marijuana town hall. You see me with my black business equals black power shirt on there? I walked into this and I was one of the few black people. I had a shirt in that said black business equals black power. I went to Mr. Sisolak first and said this. And then I got up and I had my hand up and they were trying not to, not to recognize me. I said, Mr. Sisolak, I said black people have been disproportionately, um, uh, disproportionately put in jail for marijuana use and for selling marijuana illegally. I said, now that it's legal, we're disproportionately left off the, the, the food chain of being able to economically grow and own. I said, what are you gonna do to make sure that black people have an opportunity in this growth industry? First question, yeah, yeah, you're right, but we gotta take care of our veterans. I didn't ask you about veterans. I asked you about black people. We need to understand Talk about us and don't think you always got to add somebody in so that it'll be acceptable to everybody else. That's why they created the minority and diversity tag. But guess what? If a couple of us are talking, it goes through years. I nah, just let them talk. When a gang of us are talking, well, maybe we need to do something. We've got other industries that are around here other than the marijuana, but I use that as an example. We have to start voicing opportunity that we get into growth industries and they tear down these barriers so that we can own and operate and not just be employees. Because remember what I said, 100% employment happened in slavery. Union, non-union opportunities. We need to work with the unions to bring more black people in. Not just work with demand. Guess what? Part of what we want to do as we go in and kick them in the teeth about the uh, community benefits program is say, we want you to work with the union to specifically bring in black people. Don't give me hymns and all. You know, they can go in, snap their fingers, and bypass a lot of this BS if they want to for friends and family. But when it comes to us, they hold us to the letter of law. Oh, you got to do A, you got to go B, you got to do C, and go forward. We have to use our clout when we have clout to say this is what we want or this is what you'll get. But if they believe that we won't do it, then they won't do it. I have a young man, and I tell people from a social justice aspect, how many of y'all know Stretch Sanders? Let me tell you something. The police aren't afraid of our pastors. Minister Stretch Sanders is the only person they're afraid of. You know why they're afraid of him? You know why he's afraid of him? He shut down the strip for two minutes. He shut down the strip. He went to jail shutting down the strip because of social injustice. So they're afraid of him because they know he'll bring the noise. 
So they'll talk to him. This last one, the first person they wanted to talk to was Minister Stretch Sanders. Because they know he don't play. They know he's not worried about being nice in their sandbox. He'll work with them as long as they listen and do what they say they're going to do. And we have to be like that from an economic aspect, is let them know we'll do what we have to do. Because guess what? These boys don't understand. I'm ready to put a suit in saying, look, AB 281 is what you should be under, and I'm ready to take their bond and shut down the stadium if I need to. We have to be willing to say, folks, we're going to do what we have to do and not worry about whether it's nice or it's likable or you should do this or you should do that. We have to say it's time that we start to look out for people who look like us. And we need the people who don't look like us to understand why and to support us. Because back in the day, they did support us. And even now, we just need people to say, we, we've had everybody else's back. It's time you have our back. Hey Brian, yeah. Can I please say something about Yes, please, because I'm at the end anyway. I, <laughs> uh, Jonathan Ogden, you're right about Frank, but Jonathan Ogden, I don't think he has any other parties, but he and his wife has uh, marijuana in Henderson. Yeah. Uh, there are two cultivations and one dispensary. Yeah, he, he's, he owns a, a dispensary, too. Okay. One thing I want to bring up is sometimes people ask, particularly our Caucasian brothers, say, why do I have to have these black groups? Once again, I was a founding member of the Black Professional Firefighters of Las Vegas. Now, there's a group, they're out of Atlanta. They have about 30,000 members, which I'm going to become a member of. They're the answer, our answer to the National Rifle Association. Mm -hmm. and, and I saw this brother on national TV, and they said, well, why do I have to have a black group? And the brother said, when the brother who got shot, remember the brother got shot by the police, he was carrying, he had a car to carry? Yeah. Yeah. The National Rifle. Stay rifle silent. Didn't say a word. Mm -hmm. He said, that's why. He said, we, we, we think different from them. When I said they're wrong to carry weapons, because we're going to carry ours too. But the bottom line is, y'all, sometimes we have to have our own groups because other folks don't understand what we're about and why we do what we do. It's tragic that these folks, all this talk they do, and they wouldn't stand up for a man who had a, a car to carry a weapon, and he got shot by the police, they wouldn't even open their mouth. So the brother from the, the black, uh, they're not called a rifle association, but this black group who, who are 30,000 members and they're grown, they only been around for five years. They said, we have to have things for us, man, because it's tragic and it's sad, it's disappointing that the National Rifle Association would not open their mouth when, the, when this black man was killed, and he had the proper credentials to carry the weapon. And he was shot down like a dog. So we have to stand up, y'all. And, and in 20, here we are <laughs> near 2020. It, it's really sad, but we must stand up and be counted, you guys. And see, I don't, I, I never, I've never been afraid to say that I'm black. I see my black face every morning when I get up. And I want my, my, my 10 grandchildren who are black, five boys, five girls, to be proud of their grandfather who said he's going to stand up and be a man. I ain't cowering down. I served in the United States Army. I was a draftee. So why should I come down here and I join the <coughs> fire department and I get crowded by these cats talking about, you think you bad. Y'all better be glad I didn't go to Vietnam. I got shot right in this community. I still got shotgun pellets in my face. Got shot right in, in West Las Vegas. Why am I supposed to cower down to my white colleagues? And some of us will do that. All we have to do is stand up and be men. And I know a whole lot of them cats down in the department didn't like me, but you know what they, they told me? We respect you, because you stand up. We must stand up, men. Because women already been carrying the load. They already been carrying the load. We gotta stand with them. In yeah. fact, we should be out front. Absolutely. But anyway, I get on the soapbox. So it, it bothers me, man, that we, we allow people to just kick sand in our face. And, and something that one of the cats said to, to uh, Brian and I at the, uh, the benefits meeting, he said, well, you guys should be attacking the benefits committee or the stadium authority. You guys should be down at the union. First of all, unions have been very racist toward black folks. All you got to do is check the history. Yep. And first of all, if anybody needs to be talking to the union, it should be the Raiders folks. They should say, look, why y'all can't get us some folks from these unions? Do you have any black folks in there? Bring them in. What are Bring you doing to recruit? 
Don't try to put it on us. And then to say that they have to be qualified to do this and that. I was with a group called New Ventures Capital Development Corporation. We had a $100 million portfolio until they kept needling us, working us. And I'm talking about the Small Business Administration, doing things that just kept clipping at us, kept clipping at us. We said, okay, forget y'all, we're done. We're just reorganizing them. But we stand up for our folks, man, and we should all be about that. And I ain't saying going down and going crazy on people, but being very, very firm and assertive, aggressive, whatever they want to call us. Strategic. I've been that way all my life. At 68, I don't plan to stop now. And I want young black men to see me and say, hey, that's a brother that's going to stand up, not some brother getting up there shucking and jiving and getting my look. See, when, when I first, when we first started with the black firefighters, do you know what me and this other brother, Larry Powell? He said, look, come over here. If y'all just kind of calm down, we're going to take care of y'all. No, you're not. First of all, it ain't, it ain't about us alone, the two of us. It was about our community and our black people, black young men and women in these, in these fire service jobs. We want an equal opportunity to promote us. We want a level playing field. And we took them to task. And a lot of brothers got promoted as a result, but not brothers who couldn't do the job. Because when I became the fire chief, some brothers come, oh, don't come and put your hat off and you can't, you ain't got no game, man. This, this job is too dangerous. I'm not just promoting you because you're black. Are you kidding me? But that's what sometimes our people want. We should never do that. If you ain't bringing some game to the game, you don't get nothing. Black, white, red, blue, male, female, you get nothing. And that's where I'm going to stand again till the day I die. Mm -hmm. Hey, folks, thank, thank you, Dave. I appreciate that. We're, I've finished going through a little bit of who we are. This expo has been more about this year. Number one, this is the eighth annual, and I decided that we're going to have it no matter what, and we're going to grow it into something that's going to be national. But we need you all. That's why today is really about membership. And, and Brian, I'm going to pay my dues. I, I apologize. I've been so busy doing it. I know, man. But I, I need to pay my dues. If I'm going to lead by example, because the dude's like 25. Yeah, I'm finna go down here and have a couple glasses of wine. It's gonna cost me 25. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. So, so we need you because we have, we need you and he, we need you to bring your friends. Right. Yes. Well, yes. Does anybody know what the Urban Chambers annual dues are? Actually, I'm not here to talk. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Anybody know? Because I was, a, I've been a member of them for ever since I moved here from Detroit, Michigan. And I found out what this brother's dues were. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go talk to this brother. Yeah. It's expensive to be part of the urban chamber, but what are you getting for? And, and as I said, and here's the thing, and I'm glad he said that. I'm going to say something. We respect everybody's game, yep. but we're here to deal with issues. We want to put together training programs for black people. We want to do things that add value because $25 is 25 But guess what? If we, we need members here, we have members who understand financial literacy. Uh, Mr. Harvey, tomorrow is going to talk a little bit about insurance and taxes. Um, we, have people, we have people who know how to start a business. We have no people how to set up one and how to increase businesses, how to get funding. Tomorrow, and please bring some people here. We have um, Jerry Merritt coming. How many of you all have heard of Nevada First? It's a loan program. How many people, let me tell you, Nevada First was put together and was pushed by Ms. Dina Neal, Assemblywoman Dina Neal, and some of the black assembly people because they, they saw a need access to capital so that small businesses like yourselves who can't get the standard loans would have an opportunity to grow. You only have to have a 620 FICA score to get money from them. Now, I don't have the numbers, but I don't think enough of us are applying and enough of us are getting those funds. Another situation where our black assembly people have fought for opportunities for us, but because number one, we don't know about them, and number two, we're not disseminating information from those other areas then we're not taking advantage of them. So Jerry, Ms. Jerry Merritt is going to be here about 
noon, 11.30 noon. So if you want to find out about how, you can get up to $100,000. I think it's 50,000 unsecured and 100,000 secured. Access to capital, folks. If you're thinking about starting a business or growing a business, I think if you're new, if you're just tar starting a business, if you put together your business plan, you can get $25,000. If you've had an existing business, you can get $50,000. We need to we need to put in so many black applicants that we see that we are the ones that are getting the opportunities. And then we need to be looking at them. Number one, we get them there and then we put an eye on it and say, okay, why aren't there enough black people getting it? Bank of Nevada, because even then, it goes through the Bank of Nevada for approval. And if nobody's getting an eye on it, who are they gonna give that person with the, uh, with the 620 FICA, that person with the 690? FICA. They're going to give it to the 690, right? They ain't if we're watching them and say there ain't enough black people getting this thing and we're going to let you know. Here's the minimum requirements. We expect to see more people who look like us getting the loans. Maybe their criteria isn't really as effective as it should be for us. But guess what? If nobody is asking them questions, it's business as usual. And if a group is here, we can get stuff like that done. We can't do it with a few people, but with a bunch of us, hey, you're going to work on the public works. You're going to work on the radio stadiums. You're going to work on this. I talked to a young man uh, that was telling me, KB Homes, or in these non-union jobs, there's a bunch of opportunity out there that we're basically letting fall to the, 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 to the sides. Anybody hear about the Red Rock suit just recently? I guess there was a, a mixed kid. Their mother took them to work and, and they basically fired her. She was a, a, a tennis person because she, her kids were mixed. Unfortunately, I go back to the old rule, I'm mixed. It just had, didn't happen to be in this, this part. You know, that always blows my mind, but that's another story. But the bottom line is we have the opportunity. Nobody, everybody's kind of letting it go. But if we create the Black Business Council, we should be going to that uh, country club and say, Mr. and Mrs. Country Club, we, we're about that suit. How many black businesses are working for you? You got anybody who's doing, what, doing any work for you? It's time to change. So guess what? People who have businesses here can start to get work from some of those people. Because now they're like, oh, we just got out of a suit. We don't want them coming here, opening up our books and saying you're discriminating and you don't hire any black folks. Does that make sense? There's opportunities to grow your business by being part of the Black Business Council. We got people in the medical fields. Guess what? They go down to, uh, they go down to state capital by themselves to talk for stuff. I envision us getting a bus and going down there and saying these are the issues we want to talk about. We have to be strategic and we have to understand the power we have. We're like that elephant that's on this stake that we can rip and go out here and cause havoc. But we've been trained to stay on our chain. We have power. We just don't know how to use it. It's time to break the chains, folks. So I've been doing a lot of talking, but I thank people for coming. I'm encouraging you, if you like what we talked about today, get your folks to join the Black Business Council. We are growth, we are, we are small, but we will grow into what you want to do. So I'm gonna change it over now. We're gonna let some of the folks here introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their candidates that came here. But I wanna hear from you all. What is it you would want from the Black Business Council to be a member? And whoever wants to start first, you can start. Anybody? Representing myself, like I am representing candidates, uh, I'm sorry, but I came here uh, more as just a person trying to get more information. Um, I do like what I hear because, in fact, there are a lot of issues and grievances that we have, particularly in each community subsection. We are what we consider a community subsection because we are the black community. Uh, they we say, you know, we're not a minority community, we are the black community. Uh, we have particular issues that need to be addressed. 
Um, one thing that I have found is that uh, without proper uh, dialogue, you know, with being able to get in front of the people who can listen and make those big changes, then it's just not going to happen. Um, one thing that we look at, especially for me, is that I'm from the South Side of Chicago. Um, you know, I'm raised in an area that is not, uh, it does not have a lot of economic viability. You know, like it's not a lot of money in the community. However, it is majority 90% African American. Uh, you can see the different ways that people interact with each other in those particular areas. They're not taught about uh, how to create a business. They're not taught about um, taxes, licensing, anything that you would really need to actually do something other than work for somebody your entire life and die. What we need is more activity in our community to go ourselves. And that would come from having higher representation, having leadership programs for youth, adults, and anybody in the community that can actually and wants to make those changes. Um, one thing that's very heartbreaking for me is that nowadays, the youth, they get all of their information from media. They think that by buying the latest toys and bling, bling, whatever you call it nowadays, they, they want these shiny things that aren't going to get them anywhere in the world. Nowhere. And all you're doing is creating this economy where you have consumers buying things that they don't need for reasons that they don't even know. We need more leadership programs. And again, not on any type of candidate. This is me representing myself as what I feel is necessary. And I do want to talk to everybody at some point because what I would like to do is sponsor your next meeting, have everybody actually speak on what they want. I want you to be able to write a message to our editor so that you can actually be able to have your voices heard, have your voices heard. And if that sounds good to anybody, you know, let me know. I also meant to say, Dana actually did the VIP, which means he is now also a member and he gets one of my t-shirts, but he, he joined it. So I, I thank you. And you get to select one other person to be a member. Can I just say, I paid all of that out of my pocket. I don't know if you saw, but like, I was, I wanted to support him. That was something that I was just like, yes, I am joining the VIP Anybody else want to say? Anybody, any questions, concerns? What would you like to see to make you make it worth your time? Because I asked this question because people have said before, I mean, we are all trying to pay our bills. So to take your time even to come out here, I thank you because I know it's important. Time is money, money is time. But we want to know too, uh, if any of y'all, what did you think? What do you think? Uh, what would you like to see to make me spend my time to support an organization like the Black Business Council? Anybody? I got a couple of points to say. Um, first point, I was trained in uh, Texas to become a state senator, so I think a little bit differently, I think, than people out here in Las Vegas. Um, most of the time, our black-owned businesses and companies, we don't actually put each other on each other's advisory boards and committees. We don't, for some reason, we mm -hmm. want to keep everything to ourselves that's not a good way to have you don't know everything yourself so if you have advisors on your advisory board mm -hmm. that are other black businesses he might know how to do certain things in finance he might not know how to do certain things in marketing uh, business plan development we've got to learn how to appoint people to our, our advisory boards and do things a little bit differently than what we do Shares of stock, when I talk about issuing IPOs and shares of each other's stock, we have to learn the lessons. You don't always have to say, I want to be part of his company, but if he has a, even if it's a small company with a thousand shares, do a stock swap. You're swapping value for value in stock. We don't understand that. And so I'm a little different cut because I came up understanding from a black business and entrepreneurial family, you've got to do things like we used to do when Black Wall Street was going strong. All of you have heard of Black Wall Street, right? Mm -hmm. What were they doing that was so different, that was so good, that they were actually loaning money to other cultures, the white people. They were loaning money to white people because mm -hmm. they were doing so good. They understood 
how to do stock swap, how to issue IPOs. All of that stuff can be done. It's easy to learn. It's not hard, but we just don't do it. Why? We're taught to be so separate, so divided. You have to start learning how to understand and trust each other. So what if he doesn't let me in on his secret of his total company? Well, if I own 5,000 shares of his stock, okay, it's worth something. Put a par value on it. $2 a share, do an IPO, $7 a share. You do the math yourself. We don't learn things in the financial realm. It's reserved for people that go to Yale and Harvard and Princeton. Okay, I didn't go to any of those schools. But because I was trained to become a state senator, I learned things and I don't go into any situation without going in there to learn and understand what are they doing that makes them so successful? What are we doing that's not making us so successful? Did you go to the, six, the Million Man March? I didn't. I owned four auto shops when I was in Dallas and one of them was a partnership with Tim Brown who used to play for the Raiders. Everybody was asking me, Terry, are you going to the Media Man March? I'm like, no. Why? Because I sent a letter and I published it in the Black Economic Times newspaper in Dallas. I sent a letter to Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. I wanted to know if you can get a million black men together. You're having them to travel to Washington, D.C. for feel good. You're going to stay in hotels we don't own. You're going to rent charter buses that we don't own. You're going to eat in restaurants that we don't own. You're going to stay in hotels that we don't own. Tell me two weeks before you go to this trip that you're going to say, okay, now that you've saved up your $2,000, that's the average of what it costs to go up there, Let's put that into an escrow account. Let's start a recirculation of those dollars into our community. Show me that plan and then I'll go. Crickets, like you said. You could have called it whatever you want to call it. Minority Business Insurance Corporation. Because that's really what we have over our head is called the FDIC. What is the FDIC? Does anybody know? It's a gigantic insurance corporation, but what does it own? It, it owns the banking system, the financial system that we all are a part of. But guess what? It has stockholders and shareholders. Is it us? No, but they keep us <clears throat> locked out because guess what? We don't understand how money works and how stock works and how the capital works and we don't want anybody to train us. In part I can teach you a lot of things. He can teach you a lot of things, but we have to put ourselves together with the area he knows best, the area I know best, the area you know best, but I'm telling you, even if you own a small share of stock, most small companies, when they do their LLCs or their ink incorporations, they only do a thousand shares. I know one lady owned an organization that has a hundred million shares of stock. And I'm on her advisory board. She has a company called Women in Trades, Inc. Women in trades? What's that? Oh, the unions, the Teamsters. This young lady has some power, and there are people who are trying to keep their thumb on her because this is something new for Nevada. And the people that are in control do not want her to grow an advantage. But I'm going to help her because I understand what she's doing. And if she joins the Black Business Council, we'll help her. There you go. Yeah. So. Like I said, folks, anybody else have any comments? But we're going to let some of the folks who came here, they supported the uh, Black Ex uh, Black Business, I mean, the Black Las Vegas Food Festival. And so I invited them to come in. If they wanted to talk to some business owners, they wanna, they've heard a little bit of what we said. 
So now they can tell us a little bit and you all can ask them some questions. So without further ado, come on up and, and tell them who you are and what and, and a little bit about Tulsi and then we'll go over here to Yang and then we'll go over to Gast. Okay. Yeah, it is. I was trying to find the light. Um, does anyone mind being live? Because I, this is actually. This Hold is this for a second. Let's see if I can find the light. I want to. I want to record this because I do want to take this back to. Hmm? I'm saying this. Please, please um, look. My name is Lynn. I'm a local volunteer uh, coordinator in Los Vegas for Tulsa County Public Schools. Um, I'm actually going to be talking about our
has gone on for too long. When one last thing I want to say about Tulsi, and I can tell you from my heart because I've met her, and I'm sorry, I cried. We need to have a person in office that actually cares about people and cares and actually is not afraid to say that we're all God's kids and that we all have the right to well-being and we all have the right to thrive and we all have the right to be free of religious, racial, sexual orientation, whatever bigotry that you have going on in this country, that, you're, that it's, it's everyone's right to be who they want to be and who they are. And Tulsi's not afraid to say that. And not afraid to, if you look at, I'm gonna, if you come to the back table, TulsiGathering.org has all of her policies, but all of her congressional record. And it spells very clearly how she's a person for people. And she's not afraid to talk. She's not afraid. Um, but really, what I wanna hear is. <coughs> I know it's kind of a, it's uncomfortable, but is there anything that you would like to say if Tulsi was standing here? Is there anything that you would like to say? Anything that you, you feel like you need? Anything that, what would it, what do you want in candidate if, if Tulsi's standing here? And I love your idea about having a forum. I've been wanting to have a forum for the people in this community to come and just and talk and, and talk as if the candidate was here. Anyone want to? Any questions? Anything? Any questions? Any comments? Comments? There's information in the back. Um, appreciate Brian for all that you do to effort this entire stage. All your efforts to <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're going to get the next person to come up. Thank you. Um, we just had the Black Las Vegas Food, Food Festival. We had over seven candidates come out. And like I said, we invite them to come here a little bit because many times we don't have the opportunity to tell them and then listen to them and then hope they go back to people and say, these are important. I mean, one of the things I'm gonna say about Tulsi, it hits home. If you look at the amount of money we have spent on these wars that we should have never been in, we wouldn't have a deficit today. The Japanese say to us, I mean, or what it is, the China says, you mad at us? You all have been perpetual war. You're the reason you're in debt. We just loan you the money. Yeah. Now. And they made a comment about that you guys need to fix your infrastructure like the job that Bill was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And guess what? If we weren't in these ever, never, ever any wars, we could fix it and not be in debt. So it, it's, it's important to understand that, but I also want to say it's important to understand the issues of, uh, of what is happening because of all these money. Now, there's not many things that I agree with when it comes to uh, number 45, and that's what I call them, number 45, and leave it at that. I do believe that we have to end these never even wars, but the difference of opinion is you can't just snatch and run. You can't just run. You can't destabilize uh, an area and then walk out and leave these people who helped you to their own feet. But we have to eventually have a exit strategy that makes sense, but is an exit strategy so that we aren't being the policemen of the world. So I, I can say when it comes to 45, I believe his desire to get out the in, is, is, is a good one. I just don't believe his execution makes any sense because we are the leaders of the world, and when you do that, you disable the world. So who's what? Yang table, you wanna come up, tell people a little bit about who is Yang. How many people have ever even heard anything about Yang? Anybody? You got one? Okay, two? Okay, a little bit. So here's, here's a chance to find out a little bit about one of the people running. <laughs> Speaking for yourself. Um, yeah, so most of what I'm speaking of is kind of stuff that I've heard Yang say personally, or my own personal beliefs and why I'm supporting him. Um, but before I do that, like, what issues are you guys looking forward or like what's most important to you for the upcoming election? Like, what are you concerned about? Uh, okay. <coughs> Anybody else? 
Healthcare. Healthcare. Economic inequality. That's easy to Google these days. Yes. It's online. Yeah. The information, the data is out there. But um, another thing is a lot more privacy. Um, kind of data is now the most important economic resource. It is now um, data is more valuable than oil. Um, and a lot of the data we have, we're not receiving any money from either. Um, yeah, I have a question. I'm really not a speaker. Um, but um, so yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of different issues. These, um, universal health care is something that's also tackling. Um, when in doubt, I tend to refer people to do their own research because I can say whatever I want, but at the end, it's better if you look it up for yourself. Um, his website is ian2020.com. He has over 150 policies that are fleshed out, um, ready for you to read. He has a book called The War on Normal People, which explains a lot of his policies and also the need for UBI. Um, and for me personally, what really sells it for me is kind of watching videos of him explaining his policies. He has tons of YouTube, um, YouTube videos, interviews of him explaining his policies, why he came to the conclusions that he came to, and how it was how it is these policies would affect and improve the lives of everybody. Um, but before I move on, like, I like, like, what would you do with an extra twelve k a year? Like, for you, what would that? What we do when? And you got an extra 12k a year. Just no no strings, no restrictions on what you on what you spend it. What would you do with that money? Yeah. Again, oh, I, I would recirculate it as shares of stock, small business investments, because the ultimate uh, thing that I think he is here for and I'm here and probably most people are here for, if you've got a business that's regenerating profit into your community, recirculating those dollars, and then you're doing business with another small business in the same community, recirculating those dollars, you start to defeat the whole thing about, in our community, a dollar only circulates less than a half of a turn, whereas in other communities, it'll circulate four or five times a turn. That's where you start to get the advantage of saying, okay, we're building an economy that the world has really never seen since the Black Wall Street for us, for our people. Is regenerating that dollar, recirculating that thing about five or six times before it leaves the community. Right now, our dollar only circulates less than half a turn. Yeah. So for you, it's going to be kind of more about investments. It's going to be investment right back into it. Yeah. 
Here, here's a question because I, I, I want to understand a little bit more. Uh, one is on this whole twelve thousand uh, dollars. Let's say uh, you, you, you're paying twelve thousand dollars in taxes right now, f federal income taxes. So how does that work? You drop down twelve thousand uh, dollars. Yeah, I'd like to understand more of that because sometimes when I hear, okay, I'll add a value out of tax and then I'll give you $12,000, I'm like, well, you know, that, does one offset the other or whatever? So just more on that. But I do have a question, and I'll ask you, you can get back to me or you can let, let us know now. Obviously, one of the, this group was looking at the issue by 2053 black people, not people of color, not you know, veterans are headed to a zero. What specifically would he do pertaining to black people? And you may not know the answer, but I'll come back and say, send it up to him. What would he do pertaining to helping black America change the trajectory to zero when it comes to, again, the things we've talked about here? We need to have the ability to have access to capital. We need barriers broken down specifically for us you know, because everybody wants to talk about everybody else. You know, oh man, veterans, oh yeah, we're taking care of our veterans. Oh yeah, we're, you know, women, we're happy for more, but it's really not black women, it's not black veterans, it's really keeping the money in their own pot. So here's the thing, he may not have it now, but here's a suggestion going back, give me some things that specifically would make me vote for him because my issue is how do we change the trajectory to zero for my group, not everybody else. But, but I, I tend to digress and come back. We do things for veterans in a vacuum. We do things for women in a vacuum. We do things for specific groups in a vacuum. Well, damn it, I want my vacuum. <laughs> okay, no, here's, I, here's, totally here's a suggestion that you take back to him. For what he's talking about for our people, there's the discussion now going around about reparations, which I don't, I still don't think America's really going to ever give it and to us. But let, me, but let me finish. On that concept of that $12,000, let's say that that is aimed towards reparations, okay? Let's say it is. Land ownership and property ownership is one of the biggest things for building wealth. It always has been and it always will be. But we also need to get the avenue to sell those mineral rights, whatever rights that we have or rights off of that same land and that same property. Now, back in the day when there really was supposed to have been the 40 acres and a mule thing done, 
I've done some research and pulled up actual deeds of trust of that land that was actually deeded to families, but yet that land turned around and got taken away from those families. Building wealth is a really tricky thing, and just giving a thousand or twelve thousand dollars or a thousand dollars or whatever, I would suggest that within a year, most black people, that money would be out the door, spent. Um, three hundred dollar Air Jordan, uh, Air Jordan <coughs> shoe, uh, a BMW. You know something crazy that we don't produce, we don't manufacture. It's not us. That money will be out the door and gone. Because education-wise, we're not being taught and trained that we don't. You know, uh, I bought this pair of shoes from Kmart. They cost me twenty bucks. But if an African-American shoe store had a shoe, and I have had some Big Ben Walsh's before, you know how much they cost them? $14.99. Yeah, I'm a cheapskate. But why can't that shoe that my business partner, Timmy Brown, used to produce, same factory as Nike and Air Jordan, but it had his Pro Moves logo, not a swoosh. My ex went out and bought my boys $189 pair of shoes when I had those shoes for free. Of course I hit the freaking wall. That's why she's my ex. Huh. When you think stupidly and not really, doesn't, don't think about how you spend your money, 72% of the households in this country, they are women controlled and head of household. Us guys gotta step up to the plate and say, look, so I, you're not gonna go out here and spend a month's worth of payroll on a freaking pair of tennis shoes. I know Michael Jordan's famous, but that swoosh don't mean anything to me. So, um, it seems like you're talking a lot about financial literacy, which is something that's definitely missing in a lot of black communities. Um, and I don't know if that is necessarily a presidential answer. It's definitely something more along the lines of We'll put the money uh, into education. Yeah. Well, no, 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 I was going to say, along the lines of public education, of, of teaching stuff like that. And I know Andrew is very vocal about the fact that we have so many people that are going to college when we don't really have that many college jobs. He's really invested in, one, having people start their own businesses, um, which is personally what I would do with an extra 12 pay a month, uh, 12 pay a year, sorry. Um, because right now I'm paycheck to paycheck. Uh, paying off student loans, paying off credit card debt, um, and I have ideas for businesses that I would like to start, but that's not possible because I already have my my money's already locked up. Um, but again, that's part of the thing is, is with this is that you're not prohibiting where people can spend their money. Um, yes, financial literacy is something that needs to be taught. I think to black people um, and just just across the board, that's something that a lot of white households are seeing. Well, So that's a larger issue, um, but I know that's something that he's interested in, in, in kind of, one, being more proactive in getting uh, kids that go to grade schools, learn trades, learn vocations, as opposed to all putting them to college and learning college jobs. Yep. Um, and in terms of reparations, I'm honestly very hesitant when I hear candidates talking about that, because the likelihood of it getting done is seems very, very minimal, but putting direct resources of thousand dollars a month into your hands, regardless of, of what your color, your race, your ethnicity is, that's tangible change. Um, no one can do it, that is totally us. Okay. Um, let me let, let me make a, a thought. I want to bring that to you and I apologize for coming in. Yeah. He's going to get it right now. He, uh, Rich is looking for it. And actually we're going to take a quick break and then I'll find the lights and get yeah, it turned yeah. on. Yeah, I'm gonna get that turned on right now. And for Richard's looking for, yeah, there we go, there we go. See, it changed. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make this statement. Thank you. I'm gonna make this statement not just to you, but I want all of the candidates who are here to listen, and hopefully others. Thought. Yes. Absolutely.
I agree. I want to give you a thought, and this is for all of the candidates, both here and not here. Um, some thoughts, and I want you to, when you talk, go back to your, your, your folks. We in the black community hear a lot about opportunity zones. Opportunity zones, they're so great, opportunity zones. I'm very much anti-opportunity zones because people like Trump's kids, are the ones who get the opportunity for those zones and that's the opportunity to increase gentrification and to basically eliminate historically black uh, areas in the blink of an eye. Uh, we need to have people talking. So you want, I'm giving you some, some, nid, some tidbits to think about. We need to be talking about not opportunity zones, but uh, some type of programs that are designed uh, revitalization zones where you have to live in that area or you have to have been historically from that area and then there would be grants and loans but there are requirements that you hire X percentage of black folks because you're in a predominantly black area you got to build something if it's a small manufacturing facility if it's a Starbucks whatever because I look at places like Gary Indiana where I grew up the biggest problem they have there is access to capital. The biggest problem they have to grow that area is other people want the land, they want to control the land, opportunity zones, so that they can control the money and then they can also displace the people there. We need programs in the, that look at predominantly areas and I'm using Gary as one, maybe Cleveland, but look at these areas and HBCUs where we are investing money to keep HBCUs, HBCUs, to keep them so that they now become relevant because you're putting in technology programs, relevant because maybe there's a way to reduce the cost of, uh, of going to school there, but also it is bringing in the kind of uh, job training and opportunities that are going to be uh, relevant in this time. So we ask that there are some things you can do specifically for the black community. Uh, everybody else is doing pretty good. And, and all I come back and say that any candidate that'll get my vote, don't tell me free for all, don't tell me, you know, this, you know, whatever we're doing for everybody is going to help you because historically that hasn't happened. And we look for things that say, just like we take care of veterans, just like we take care of somebody else, we're gonna do these things because it's, guess what? you can pinpoint certain areas that are dying. The reason in Chicago we have the high crime rate and we have the high killings that the president talks is because there's no economics and people are fighting over crumbs. If we rebuild the economics in predominantly black places, you'll get my vote. It doesn't even have to be here, but put in a plan that says we're going to sustain these areas, but guess what? I love everybody, but I like living around myself. I don't always like being a minority uh, in an area that's going, and we need to have a way that doesn't mean, okay, if I decide to live around where I'm the minority, majority, I can't live at the same standard of living. And sometimes if we give plans that can revitalize predominantly black areas, then we're revitalizing the black economy. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, it, these um, are your beliefs, and I appreciate right. it. Yeah. Um, but um, I, a lot of these problems I do definitely, definitely agree with. I just see a tangible answer. Gotcha. Um, and I know black, the black community faces their own problems, um, but I would also just be cautious to say that we're the only people that have problems, or the only people that don't get what we tended to, because there are a lot of people in the rich communities um, currently right now that are going through suffering. Automation is going to affect everybody. Yeah. Um, Just to automation at MGM, like um, all those bartenders that were replaced by robotic servers, mm -hmm. um, that's going to be something that's going to be standard in the next three to five 
yes, affecting us, but also affecting us not exclusively um, for our benefit. So it play a big part into us being able to move forward. Okay. And, Thank you, sir. We appreciate you giving us your opinion. And these are not the views of the candidate. <laughs> Come on up. Good evening, everyone. My name is Benjamin Chalmer, and I'm here representing Secretary Julian Castro. A little bit about him before I go on and talk about uh, what the conversation has been about this evening. Uh, Secretary Castro grew up on the west side of San Antonio, second generation immigrant. Uh, his grandmother came to this country uh, by herself as a seven year old uh, because her parents were, uh, had died in Mexico, went to live with some uh, family members in San Antonio and was raised, uh, raised by family members. Uh, eventually she had uh, Julian's mother, raised her as a single mother. Uh, Julian's mother, Rosie Castro, um, was a big activist in the San Antonio uh, Chicano movement, uh, and she raised her, or she raised Julian and Joaquin as a single mother as well. Um, went through public schools, ended up going to Stanford and uh, Harvard Law thanks to the opportunities that his, their mom were able to uh, provide them and the opportunities that they were provided in San Antonio. Uh, came back to San Antonio after graduation uh, to give back to the community. Um, he became the youngest uh, city council member of San Antonio at the age of 26, um, then became the mayor, um, and eventually in 2014 was tapped by President Obama to be the, uh, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, he is, uh, Secretary Castro I should say, um, deeply cares about the community, uh, and we're running a campaign that's more of a social justice movement than a campaign, uh, because every time he comes to a community, he goes to where folks are often not uh, being heard. Uh, specifically here in Nevada, he's one of the candidates that came the most. Most recently, he was here briefly for a uh, plan for uh, the plan and people's action forum on Saturday. But he's been to the state eleven times, uh, and every time he's come uh, to the, the state, uh, whether it be uh, here in Southern Nevada, Northern Nevada, and Reno, uh, he was actually the first candidate ever uh, to go to West Wendover. Uh, he cares about going to communities that are often uh, left out and not part of the conversation uh, because he wants to hear them. He wants to hear what, what's keeping them up that will help everyone, uh, especially affected by the systematic, uh, the, the systematic uh, barriers that are often put up for brown and black folks like you and I. Uh, when he was here in Las Vegas in April, he was the, he's been the only politician <coughs> that's local here in Clark County, state level or federal, uh, to visit the, the, the tunnels underneath the strip. Uh, and he likes to say it's ironic that above and on the strip, it's the glitz and glamor and the lights and literally millions and millions and billions of dollars flowing through the strip while underneath in the storm drain, there are people living underneath the streets. Uh, he visited uh, back in August uh, Mario's West Side Market on the corner of Lake Mead and uh, corner of Lake Mead and uh, MLK. Uh, he visited that because it's a in that area in that neighborhood, as some of you may know, is considered a food desert, an area where uh, people. I think I can't remember the exact definition of a food desert, but it's pretty much it's it's either like a mile or two miles radius where there's no food. Uh, it's only fast food. There's no grocery stores, there's no place to buy fresh uh, greens or any of those sorts. Um, and it's a staple within the African American community, uh, which is that the probably African American community uh, on MLK. Uh, to some of the topics that we've been talking about tonight, uh, the big one that I know is fresh on my mind because it was just released this past week um, is his first chance plan. Uh, a lot of folks, and we talked about it a little bit uh, or significantly throughout the night. Most folks don't get a first chance or even a second chance. Uh, folks that look like you and I, uh, and especially, especially in the African American community, uh, most of y'all are familiar with the term uh, school to prison pipeline. Uh, he recognizes that. He's heard the conversation, or he's heard the conversations that staffers like me uh, have been 
talking, he's heard the comp, he listens to people that he's talked to, and he, he knows that there's systematic barriers that are blocking people from succeeding, from even getting that first chance. Um, so he understands that part of that is not getting proper education. The big thing about his, um, his campaign and his social justice movement is making sure that everyone's properly educated and starting young. His big thing is making sure that we have, uh, we expand pre-K education to everyone. Uh, because studies have shown that uh, young kids, the sooner we're able to get them educated, the better off they'll be for their own life. The better off they'll be um, and not get involved with some trouble. Um, in part, uh, like we were talking about earlier, um, financial literacy, that's all part of an education problem, uh, education process, making sure that we're all properly educating our folks because he also understands that higher education, specifically college, is not for everyone. He understands that some people might be better off going to a trade or they be, they'll specifically want into a, going into a trade. So he wants to make sure that we um, expand on those programs, making sure that everyone is prepared the best they can, whether to be go to college, to go to a trade school, or learn a trade, um, or whatever it may be, they're prepared once they graduate high school. He wants to make sure that we raise our graduation rates. Uh, he wants to look at what's keeping kids from going to school. Because sometimes kids don't make it to school and it's issues that are going on at home. And it's not necessarily uh, what folks may think of right away. It's different issues. It's um, He wants to make sure we expand um, education as well to be make it more of a community schools, bring it into the entire family together. Um, if there's some social services that the family may need, expanding that to make sure that we have wraparound services so a student doesn't have to worry about whether or not they're getting food, whether or not, uh, whatever issue that sometimes keep kids up at night as well, uh, that are supposed to be adult problems and then helping out their adult family members, making sure that they're not having to go through that, those issues. Uh, one of the biggest things about Secretary Castro as well is that he is the only candidate that's recognized on the debate stage that police violence is also gun violence. He understands that in order to make sure that uh, young black men and young black women aren't being shot up by the, our police force, is making sure that we train them properly. Um, right now, I believe it's only a, a short nine, uh, nine week training for police officers. He wants to make sure we introduce more anti-bias training, more de-escalation training, uh, making sure that we don't have um, these shootings happening pretty much, all, it seems like every week. Uh, he wants to make sure that we solve that issue. Uh, those are the, some of the things that I've, I've heard from the conversation and some of the things I wanted to make sure I talked about. Are there any other issues specifically? Yes. The issue of uh, police nonviolence against African Americans, mm -hmm. especially people of color shooting, <clears throat> Trained to shoot the kill versus training to shoot the wound has always been an issue, and I've talked to a lot of police officers. My godfather was a, a Dallas County District Attorney officer, and in the Dallas area of Texas, they were trained to shoot the wound, even though now, in today's climate, they're being trained to shoot the kill. They're also being told behind closed doors, if it's a black guy, shoot the kill. Why is that only done in our population when every other population, some of these guys that do these mass shootings at these schools, they want it. If that cat doesn't kill himself, they won't kill him. If he's white face, they won't kill him. But an African-American unarmed person, they shoot the kill, never shoot the wound. Well, that's the kind of policies they've got to put in there, and they've got to make sure that if the guy does shoot to kill and not to wound, he needs to be prosecuted. These guys don't get prosecuted. They get turned loose by the grand jury. That's why they keep doing it, is because they know they're going to get turned loose. So yesterday specifically, uh, Secretary Castro was at the 2020 forum in South Carolina. And he did touch a little bit about that, about police accountability and making sure that we actually uh, 
keep police departments accountable, um, in addition to the anti-bias training, making sure that just because they see a young African American, a young black man, or, or anyone, that they're not afraid, that they don't instinctively reach for their weapon. Uh, the, and it, uh, there's uh, one thing that he was talking about yesterday at the forum was uh, a way to keep police accountable is tie certain fun federal funding, uh, because police departments rely on a lot of federal funding uh, to be able to continue on with their programs. If they're not keeping their police officers accountable, and making sure that they're not, uh, or making sure that they aren't doing those specific things, uh, then they will receive less funding. Um, or a different way, he, he said he still wants them, he has a concrete, or figured out a concrete way to keep police uh, They turn off their body cameras when they're going for a rip, they should be fine. Yeah. And, Instantly and, fine. And the they should thing, not be able to turn their body camera and off. And one thing that he's talked about as well is, uh, Oftentimes, when a police officer is fired uh, due to that type of conduct or due to a shooting or whatever it may be, uh, they often are able to get a job two states over or whatever. And so he wants to create, he wants, under a president, uh, Castro, he will create uh, or he will have it instruct his Justice Department to keep a national database of all these officers um, that are fired for these specific reasons so they're not allowed to go back to quote unquote um, on the streets. So they won't be able to get another job um, at another police department or another sheriff's department because they've already showed those types of behavior in one place. Um, they And as much training as that may help, they may not be able to get over it and they shouldn't be able to uh, work to in the same. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. well, one of the biggest problems that I see and I've experienced it recently is a lot of these cops and highway patrol, public safety officials who have a carry a gun is fear. I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah. I had a, I do Uber and Lyft. I had a car, I was in my car with three females, three white females. And the first thing he asked me, which he already knows because when you pull up my driver's license and you pull up my tag, it says I have a concealed carry. Mm -hmm. yeah. It does say all of this. So when he pulls up, the first thing he asks is, do you have a gun? And I'm like, you know all of this information. I'm ready that I have a concealed carry. But I still answer the question. And I say, yes, I think I do. Now, the first thing he said is, don't reach for yours, and I won't reach for mine. And in my mind, I'm like, why would you tell me don't reach for you, mine, and you won't reach for yours? Like, that would be the first thing you say. Like, that don't make any sense to me. You know when especially I have a car full of females, white females to boot, that I'm sure who did reported me afterwards to Lyft and said that I had a gun and I had to lie to the lady and tell her, no, I didn't, because they didn't actually see the gun. It was just a verbal me saying, yes, I did. And I think that's the biggest issue that they have with these cops in these streets now is whether it's the lack of training or whatever it is, is the fear. Yeah. You know, I used to be a fireman just like the man used to be. I could have had a job of, or be a fireman and showing up at the fire station with fear in my heart because then I would never go on that call or I would never go into that burning building or whatever it is. So I think that a lot of these guys that they're hiring, they go to work in so much fear. It's like now that fear is pushed on to somebody else. And then it makes everybody uncomfortable. And then with everybody being uncomfortable, then everybody gets jumpy and that's how people end up getting killed. That's part of their psychological profile when they first go in and get hired. And a lot of times they're, uh, they're not being administered those tests because exactly. in order to be a police officer, you have to go through a psychological profile. It also has questions in there about your, uh, your abilities and how you view uh, people in other cultures and other communities. They are not administering those tests. Their buddies are just passing them through that psychological profile test is not being put into their record. Mm 
That's why you're starting to get some of these people in there that have prejudice already built up in their hearts. They're not going through the regular psychological process. Well, I wouldn't call it prejudice, I call it fear. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, fear is prejudice. Prejudice yeah. is fear. It's, it's the fear that you don't, of, of people you don't know and understand just because they're different from you. It's a, it's a psycho, psychological profile test that they're supposed to administer to them. Yeah. It's still fear. Um, before I wrap up, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, what you were talking about, your specific situation, similar to what you were talking about earlier about uh, Philando Castile, who was one of the, uh, who was the person that was pulled over, who mentioned that he had a concealed carry and was still shot because uh, he, although he was not reaching for his gun, um, the officers feared um, and was uh, and shot him seven times. Um, but part of getting that, rid of those... Uh, can I interrupt you one second? Yes. If you ask the person, are you carrying a gun? And that person tells you, yes, I, I have a concealed license. And the person never makes a move, and you shoot that person in cold blood, that's not fear. That's hatred. That's hatred. Yep. Exactly. That's and, and that's that murder. That's part of your psychological profile yeah. why I'm telling yeah. you these cops are being hired. They're not going through the regular uh, procedures of being hired. You can't tell me that if you answer my question direct, okay, I know you have a concealed permit. Yeah. You didn't make a move. Your hand yep. stayed up there and you shoot this person? That's hatred. And I agree. And that, like I mentioned, uh, a big thing about uh, his, he also calls this uh, his disarming, is making sure that we uh, introduce those anti bias trainings in all police departments across. Uh, the country, uh, whether it be university police, school police, or any of any police departments um, uh, throughout the country. Um, the other thing that he wants to make sure that we uh, do is um, help break down the biases and the fears and the prejudices. Is by um, who here has heard of community policing? I am. Yep. So, uh, so community policing is a, is is essentially um, connecting the police departments and the police with the community so there's less fear, there's less uh, less fear on both sides because oftentimes, um, I know in my community, uh, it may be the same case in the African American and black community, we're often scared of calling the police for a multitude of different reasons. Uh, and so, yeah, like they might shoot you through yeah, the door, a window. Not only <laughs> at, that, but at your not only the fact that you're worried about them you also be worried about calling a snitch in the neighborhood. Yes. Yeah. So let's call it for what it is. Yeah. And so a lot of times we don't come, we don't take care of our own community because we worried about calling the cops if you call a snitch. And then the people in the community realizing, oh, when well, you call the cops, now you a snitch. Yeah. yeah. But and so go ahead. part of what he wants to do is work with community uh, organizations that are already working on that and bolstering that across the country and making sure that we have trust again with, uh, if there ever was trust in some communities, making sure that we have trust again um, with our police officers in our communities. Uh, last, last thing I will say is, um, I'm not a policy expert, um, but Secretary Castro is, um, I will, my, in my opinion, absolutely amazing because every single one of the policies that he puts out, um, which you can read on williamcastro.com, he personally reviews them himself, and if he's not able to explain it himself, um, and not able to understand where each of these policy aspects are coming from, he won't put it out. So he himself, if you ever get a chance, uh, you know, he's, like I said, he's a, the candidate that's coming in most of the states, and we'll be coming more. Uh, if you ever get a chance to see him, and you ask him about one of his policy issues, or something else, he'll be able to tell you about it, and why it comes and why he's bringing it forward. Um, when yeah. he comes, is he going to come to talk to people like us here? Does he, when he comes, does he ask for the so-called leaders that are sitting there with their thumb and control over so, certain communities? Because yeah. what I'm, let me finish. What I'm asking is, when you talk to regular people in the community, like here, it's different when you talk to a Peter Guzman, excuse my language, but or a Shondell Newsom, excuse my language, or a Commissioner Weaker, excuse my language. 
certain people who are considered the leaders of the community that when they come in, they ask to talk to those leaders. It doesn't bleed down to the actual real grassroots people that he needs to be talking to. And, and let me say, I'm gonna say something for all the candidates who come. We had, we had at least seven candidates that came to the Black Las Vegas Food Festival. They came to talk to me. They didn't come, they, none of them got to get up and make speeches. They came to talk to folks in the community and I commend all of them for coming here. The folks who have come here today have come to talk to us. Now, you know, they, and I'm gonna say every one of them, if I've invited them to come out, they'll try to make it. They're trying to get candidates to come in and talk to the same people. So I commend, first of all, I wanna give all of them a hand for coming here and talking to us because not many people take the time to talk to us and not just the, the people they're pointing in direction to come in. So I wanna give them that credit to that. I do wanna say something, and this is another unpopular one I want you all to ask your folks to talk a little bit about. I'm a believer in quotas. Because one of the problems we see now, now that firefighters are making 100,000 plus a year, now that policemen are making 100,000 plus a year, now that these government jobs are lucrative, where it used to be you didn't want to be in a government job, you wanted to be in another job, you're finding less and less participation of African Americans. If we started putting quotas in and forced the issue, then maybe we would see more of the policemen who look like us and we have more on the force that can go in and, and, and help to control what's going on. Very rarely do you see a community where you have more black people over the percentages than less. So I'm a proponent of people don't like quotas, but I think we need to go back to quotas in a lot of things so that at least we start to get our fair share of opportunity. What does anybody else think? What do you all think about that? Police officers, especially. Law, fire, law but fire, fire chief, yeah. law enforcement. We have to start throughout the government because right now it's more, when I grew up, you wanted to be in, 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 the, in the private sector. Now you want to be in the government sector because of the, the they, they have a lot more opportunities. Um, I will say, um, specifically about police departments and police recruitment, I think um, these communities, he is a big proponent for going into the communities and recruiting from there and making sure that we have uh, young people of color, uh, that's part of the, the community policing, making sure that they build those relationships and bringing community members, members who grew up in that community, onto the force to help bolster that trust and to help create that trust again. Um, sort of like what you're saying. I'm not, I can't say specifics for its quotas, and I could always reach out to our HQ mm -hmm. um, and try to find out for you, but that's one thing he, he has well, said. If this, if this, if this community has, let's say, 90% or 95% of African-American, Latino, and other, why shouldn't the police force kind of look mm -hmm. halfway yeah. like that? And, and he does believe in proper representation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm just not comfortable because I don't know exactly where um, he is on quotas, but he does believe in rep proper representation. And, um, and, and that's, that's close enough. I, I, I'll call it what we need to do something because right now, disproportionately, that is not happening. We just had a graduation, folks, in the police department. Everybody was white male. Everybody. Why? Because those are million dollar jobs because they are million dollar jobs. Something's wrong, folks, and if we don't say something's wrong and we don't change what's wrong, then we'll get more of the same.
<laughs> well, it, it, that's a two-way street. I, I yeah. agree, that's what I'm saying, but I do think that when I, I've organized it with several organizations, and it was purposely not to see black people have to come. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, we need to go and ask the questions because they are very powerful, and they do an impact us. So. Okay. And as I said, join the Independent Black Voters Group. We are about 2,000 strong. Let them know, promote your candidate, and let us know where the town halls are, and then do it again, because we will come out. I have been to everybody's that I know of. I go to theirs to just listen and hear what they say. I think everybody here can say they've seen me there. If they've invited me, I try to at least make it out there. Uh, we do need to go out and find out. But also, I'm going to tell you, we, I, fo I did this for a reason. So if they want to find out what's going on, they'll find this on the Independent Black Voters Group. And hopefully they will come out. I'll tell you what, you contact me. I don't care what your ever candidate is. And you want to have something, I'll at least make sure people know. I'll at least make sure they know. So anyway, we appreciate your time. Did you want to say anything? or? Thank you all for, okay. for listening to me and listening about Take a turn, Castro again. Williamcastro.com. Um, you can find all his issues. Uh, I don't have any cards on me. I have some in my car, so if anyone yeah, yeah. wants my contact information, I'll be more than happy to give, be able to provide it. Um, we're here. Okay, we got one more and then we're going to end it, folks. I thank everybody for coming here uh, and listening. So we got one more person. Come on up, tell her who you are, who you're representing. My name is Mike, I'm the Senator Elizabeth Warren. Her whole premise for running is that first and foremost, before we do anything else, we have to tackle the corruption that's in our government before we can even begin to have a government that is on our side. And once we do that, you know, she is known for having a lot of plans that she has thought through, that she's uh, come up with after talking and listening to people who are directly affected by those problems. Then we can implement those once we tackle the corruption in our government. Uh, I don't know that I'm the, the right person uh, on the campaign to answer uh, questions on camera, but I'm just You're speaking, this is not your camera, you just letting us a little bit know a little bit about what you think. But Brian, yeah. you know, I'll stick yeah. around yeah, exactly. like right now and answer any questions that you all have. Uh, okay. In the meantime, I want to invite people out to an event uh, that we have coming up two Sundays from now. Uh, that will be a conversation over tea with uh, people in the small business community, nonprofits, and arts. So we're bringing all three of those communities together uh, to have a chance to hear what issues are important to you in 2020 and to also talk about how you can participate uh, in our Nevada caucus here, regardless of who you're supporting. We want to make sure people have the education so they know how to participate. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, it's good. So actually, I've got some flyers here. It's going to be at the Tewitt Tea Room, which is off of 15. Uh, if folks are interested, I have a few flyers I can put out here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to close this by saying.